I would not start with an email. I cannot, for the life of me, I get all these emails, you know, we do SEO, we do this. I go, seriously, you think I'm going to turn over an important business decision, some jerk on an email, you know, and you look at it, it's dot, are you deep? No. All right, thanks everybody for joining us. Um, this is another In the Know episode. Today we have David Knox, um, esteemed in the real estate industry. <laughs> and uh, yeah, just wanted to bring this to you guys. Um, he's done a lot with personal branding and building his own companies. And we're here to have a pretty good chat today. So David, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. It's always an honor. I always like to help people out in whatever endeavors they're doing. Yeah, for sure. So I really want to get to know you a little bit better and I want to shout out the audience. Okay. Um, let's kind of unpack your past when it comes to um, real estate and some personal branding and putting yourself out there. Okay. Well, uh, I started my real estate career in 1972, right out of college. I was at University of Minnesota, and a good friend of mine named uh, Darry came over and said, "Hey, what are you doing tonight?" And I went, "I don't know." I looked at the TV guy. There was nothing on. He said, "Well," I said, "Why?" He said, "Well, I'm going to go get my real estate license." I went, "Well, yeah, okay." So with that kind of conviction, I got into the real estate business and started with a small company. He started with a big company. I should have followed him to the company as well. A uh, big Vermel's maybe company and I was with a small company. And then um, the next step was my uh, the president of my fraternity, Jim Gagner, and a guy and a manager at Vermel's maybe Ralph Burnett started Burnett Gagner Realty back in uh, 1973 and I went over and joined them. And uh, I was their sixth agent. It was uh, Ralph and Dar and Jim Rankin and a couple other people, six people, and then it grew to like a couple thousand people. And of course then it went on to sell to Merrill Lynch and then they sold again, then they bought it back, and then they sold it to Coldwell Banker and now it's, you'll see it as Coldwell Banker Burnett. Hmm. And uh, Ralph is now retired as has Dar. After that, I've done well enough that Ralph asked me to start and do a fill-in for training course. So you're doing really well with buyers, go in and teach, fill in, be a substitute teacher. And I was honored, you know, to be asked to do that. And I went in, did a three-hour course. And at the end, I went, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. And I think everybody has in their life that moment where you're searching for, do I do this, do I do that, I hate this, I hate that, like, uh, nah. and then all of a sudden, bam, that's it, this is what I want to do. And at the same time, Ralph called and asked how I liked it. I said, Ralph, this was great, I loved it. And he says, well, they thought you were the best presenter of the whole three-week course. I went, well, that's a nice match. And I went on and did the, wrote a four-week training course that was used for years and years and years. And then Merrill Lynch bought the company in 80, 82. And I approached the chairman of the board, a guy named Dakin Ferris, of all Merrill Lynch, Pierce, Fenner, and Smith. And I said, you guys don't have a national training director, do you? No. I said, well, you're going to need a national training program and somebody to lead it, and I'd like that job. You know, he looked at me like, hey, it was his punk. Or, hey, you know, what are you talking yeah, about? Yeah. Sorry, keep it in your mic. <laughs> and... Uh, and a few, a few months later, I had the job. Wow. And I moved out to Stanford, Connecticut, and I helped them set up their national training program. Um, I became an instructor for the CRS courses, Certified Residential Specialist. So I was doing three-day, three-instructor courses. And that's really where I honed my speaking skills. Mm -hmm. Okay, wow. I think there's obviously a lot to unpack there. But So you, you went from like obviously going through some dark times and you're able to pull yourself out, start performing um, in real estate. So let's uh, let's dig into that a little bit. So okay. what, what was that actually like back then versus now? Because I mean, obviously there have been so many changes since then and yeah. we, we could talk about that forever. Yeah. Um, but what are some of like the, the trends that you've seen? Like when you're first starting out and you're trying to build your book and you didn't have the resources then than, as opposed to what you have now, um, how is that? What are some of the biggest differences there? Well, what's interesting is that the fundamentals, the way that I got started was with for sale by owners and open houses. And people, as a new agent, it's still the best way to start out if you don't want to spend any money. Now, if you have a lot of money, you want to buy market share and blanket it, blanket in a neighborhood with postcards and stuff like that, make it look like you own the market, you can do that. Mm -hmm. It'll cost you a fortune. But if you really want to start and you have no money, the fundamental open house expired listings for sale by owner and then working your sphere of influence. Now, if you're a new agent, they don't quite trust you yet, so you may not get a lot of business right away. If you are bringing experience from another industry, obviously that's gonna be a great way to build your business. Mm -hmm. So that's how I started back then, working for sale by owners, and if I started all over again today, I would do for sale by owners, open house expired listings, <clears throat> and of course now I'd be able to, to do a, a sphere of influence as well. 
the technology is the, is the change, and everybody says it's so different. I remember every morning we would get a physical courier delivery. We would open up, and it would be the MLS sheets in this size by district, 579, 580, 581. You take them on, you had to put them into three-ring binder by tabs, and that's how you found out what the new listings were. <laughs> so you talk, this is Civil War technology now. And I look back at some of the stuff we did, and cell phones, forget about it. I mean, pager, that was the cool thing. I got a pager, and you waited for the thing to go off. Right. And people will look at the change in technology, and often, I think they focus so much on that that they forget about the fundamentals. What are those fundamentals? St fundamentals, inter it's still a relationship business. And you've still got to uh, prospect, which means you've got to be face-to-face. -face. And um, in the book, Fanatical Prospecting by Jeff Blunt, he does a great job summarizing that there's two ways to spend time in business, building familiarity, which is branding, marketing, advertising, social media, all that stuff. Peak of the pyramid is what I call direct prospecting, where you're phone to phone, face to face, or zoom to zoom. And until you do that, you don't cross into the money. If you wanna make money just in the branding and familiarity, you gotta spend a lot of money. You and I were talking about Steve Jobs. Even you know, Apple was advertising it over and over again, but finally, what did they do? They opened up stores, so their face-to-face, phone-to-phone revolutionized it. So they figured out you've gotta be face-to-face -face with a customer. And my experience with salespeople is they will do anything to avoid any kind of face-to-face -face personal contact. They wanna do it all online, they wanna post what I had for lunch and see if somebody liked it. Then they won't get off their aspirations and go talk to another human being, pick up the phone. The greatest technology we have is phone. And in our industry, in real estate, fewer than 5% answer their phone. You know, you got these agents, what, they sell a house every quarter, they don't have time to answer the phone, you know, what? Yeah. So, Priorities. So the technology, I don't think that technology is great for starting a relationship, but it's great for maintaining it, mm -hmm. and it's great for speeding the transaction and making so many things Well, and there's, there's an element of providing value. Because, I mean, if you're just, um, you know, sending out messages to random people and trying to get business and doing the cold outreach, like, yeah, you may, you know, you're kind of shooting in the dark there, and you may get something, but if you can provide value to people you don't know or to the people that you already know, you just establish yourself as that industry expert. Because really our whole topic today is personal branding. Yeah. Um, and just kind of talking about, like, how we can use these platforms. And, you know, with everything going on, there's so much noise, right? <laughs> so, so how do you break through that noise, and how do you... Um, you know, kind of, I don't want to say maintain relevance, but maintain relevance. In the, in the digital world, obviously, I mean, you, you, you're in that market, so you know creating value and giving value and posting something that will make people want to come back and, and do business with you. And realtors, the best ones will post information on their local market. They'll post... Uh, Oh, this guy named Sam Miller would say, here, here are the shops and stores that are open during COVID. Here are the ones that, that aren't. And, um, and he has one channel where all he does is post beautiful photos of the neighborhood. Nothing to do with real estate, but yeah. people tune in and they watch that. Yep. Uh, but he's a very much a hands-on guy, too. He doesn't rely just on that. Mm -hmm. And uh, he does a video, I think it's called Two Minutes on Tuesday, where he says, you know, i got five buyers desperate to find a home. One needs a four-bedroom, two bath, mid-200,000. It's got to be a non-smoking home. Uh, if anybody watching owns a home like that, please give me a call. And he gives a response device. And I watched him do it. He gets responses right away. He'll get listings that way. Mm -hmm. So I think those are the appropriate uses of social media. Mm -hmm. What? Uh, so, I mean, obviously, b building a personal brand, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of face-to-face -face interaction. Yeah. Um, but what are some of like the mistakes you see with people trying to to put themselves out there, um, but they just never really grasp their audience? Or what are some things that you see? I think the biggest mistake I see is they, to use an analogy, where a ho hotel will have great advertising in a beautiful lobby, and their rooms are horrible, and their sheets are bad, and their mm -hmm. pillows are horrible, mm -hmm. and. Um, you know, the water barely drips out of the shower, and you, and after that, you learn to be very cynical about branding. So my view of branding, I never was, and I probably should have been more focused on branding, whether it be graphic or visual, other than having a unique look. Our focus was on delivering a good product. And I think you've got to start there. And all too often, I'll see companies, I'm not even mentioning it, but just various national companies where they come out with all their cool advertising, but you know their product is not good. They just have money. Yeah, they got a lot of money to, to buy eyeballs. So I think companies need to be so good. Here's a philosophy. Be so good you don't need branding. And then when you, give, when you do have a brand, it's relatable. 
Right. You know, I'm a Porsche guy, and uh, you talk about somebody who brands stuff well, but they back it up. They've got great products, great services. Yeah, customer service. <clears throat> great customer service. They answer their phone. I call. I was trying to get my Porsche Precision Track app to work, or some car connect, and I couldn't get it. I was looking for some code, and I thought, I'm going to call Porsche, and I call an 800 number, and I go, oh, I don't know if I have the patience for this. So I set aside time where I know I'm going to have an hour. Then I dial, and what do you want? I said, connect, car connect app. Uh, just a moment, rerouting. And someone answered the phone. Now, is, this, is this a real person? Yes, it is. Yes, I'm trying to connect my app. And for the next 20 minutes, she helped me through it. It's unbelievable. You can't get realtors to answer the phone. <laughs> um, I needed a carpet cleaned in my second home in California. And uh, water was leaked all over. You need somebody to fix it. So I said, I don't know any carpet cleaners. So I just did a Google search, carpet cleaning, Rancho Mirage. And it was country club carpet cleaning or something came up and I said oh I'm gonna all right here we go I'm gonna go down the list take me a day to get somebody to dial the number and the phone answers is this a real person yes it is my name is uh, I think it was uh, Brian and I told him the story and I said can you help me yes and he came out two hours later was at my house fixed it and then he said um, by the way you really need to put a fan on this for days to dry it out and I said I don't have a fan and I'm not there I won't gonna be there for a week and he says, would you like me to go buy you a fan at Home Depot? And I said, I'd love that. I said, would you do that? Yes. So he goes and buys a 20 buck fan. It's not the 20 bucks, it's the trip over. Man, he sets it up and uh, he gave me a bill and I added another 30 bucks to the bill, you know, tipped him for it. Mm -hmm. So was that branding? No, that was just good customer service. Yeah. So I'm going to tell everybody in our neighborhood about that customer service. And the way we look at it, it's a brand touch point. So yeah. a touch point, I mean, an interaction, uh, a physical piece of collateral, a website, all of those things are customer interactions. So making sure that each person is on brand for a company is really important. But uh, you made me kind of think of something there. So, I mean, for a lot of people, um, when it comes to personal branding and the noise and whatnot, like you have new business development people, you yeah. have um, marketing people that are trying to get out there. And I think it's so important, at least one of the mistakes I see, is that people are only talking about business. They're only talking yeah. about their services or their product. It's not full circle. So I mean, if, if you were just sitting there like just pounding real estate, but there wasn't a little bit of Dave's life in there, mm -hmm. like, I don't know if I would be as intrigued because I want to get to know you before I do yeah. business with you. Yeah. You know, because companies and brands, they're all great, but people want to do business with people. Yeah. And I think that's just one of the biggest gaps. I don't know if that's something you've seen too, but. It all comes down to relationships, right. and, and again, people will do anything to, to avoid that. They just right. want to be able to press buttons and have people enter credit cards and buy and sell, and there's some businesses that, that work that way. Mm -hmm. But when somebody signs up for a subscription on our uh, online training, I call them and call them up and say, hey, thank you very much for subscribing. It blows them away. If I can blow them away by a phone call thanking them, you know how bad customer service is. Right. All I did was call. Yeah. And and I've said for, I have a video called Answer the King Phone. And it's with the focus, nobody will do it. Everybody forgets that the phone is your greatest technology. Uh, there's a, a bank here, it was called the Business Bank. They were purchased by Bell Bank here in the Twin Cities. And a friend of mine was going to start the bank, and he asked me if I'd like to invest and be a customer. And I knew the guy who rode motorcycles with him, a guy named Brad Crone. I said, Well, that's very interesting, Brad. Let me ask you a question. If I call your, the bank, is anybody going to answer the phone? And he said, yes, we are building it around. We'll actually have live people answer the phone. And I took all my accounts, jerked them away from a big local bank, all of them, took every account away and gave him, and we're still there. And I've been there, that's been 22 years now. And you call them, they answer the phone. Yes, they have internet banking. And yes, I want to go in and it's easier to move money. So I like that. But there are times when I need to talk to Rachel Bauer, say, hey, Rachel, i got a question for you. She answers the phone or returns it very quickly. Mm -hmm. And companies need to get back all the money they, I would have them take, I'll make a number up, take 10% of the money they spend on marketing and hire somebody to answer the phone. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry to rant, but it's, <laughs> it's just such a huge annoyance. It is, it is. And I mean, it really, it does reflect on the brand, you know, how much emphasis are people putting on the customer experience? You know, do they really understand what their ideal clients are looking for? Like, not only before you acquire them, but afterwards too, like maintain that relationship mm -hmm. and really pushing them up that ladder of like, yeah, we've done a good job. Yeah, I might tell a friend to, hey, my life would be a whole hell of a lot worse off if <laughs> this brand or this person wasn't in my life. Yeah. So yeah, there's there's a bunch there. I, I love it. Um, 
Uh, one other thing on that, we, yeah. Thanksgiving's coming up and I, uh, we ordered 350 uh, Thanksgiving cards. And Harry and David, we ordered a bunch of baskets. We have a level one, two, and three for our big customers. It's a $100 basket and down from there. And I've been doing this for years. And I will hand sign 350 cards and Mary will hand address them all and hand stamp so they get opened. Her wrist is sore, but she's done with it. And I'm going to go through it. I just sit down and I go through and, hey, Jim, nice to see you. How are you doing? Thanks very much. And this time I'm going to, I am going to put a little card in. This is, by the way, here are all the new and updated videos we have for you for next year. So I thought as long as we're doing a mailing, we'll, we'll drop that in because mm -hmm. I, th I think that's a service to them. That's one of the ways we touch them every year. And then they call or email and write me and thank me for, for the Harry and David basket. Mm -hmm. So, How long did it get you... How long did it take you to get to that point to where you realized that was valuable? Because I see sometimes with companies and early brands, they think they have to have all this buttoned out, like figured out right away. So how long did it take you to get to that point to where you realized that that was something you should start doing? Oh, right away. Right away. Oh, uh, right away. I mean, immediately. I guess I was born and raised on the power of the thank you note. Mm -hmm. So the very first seminar I ever did. Mm -hmm. I sent a handwritten thank you note and said, thanks for bringing me to your state convention. I did handwritten thank you notes forever and ever. Mm -hmm. And then we've got coffee mugs. Mm -hmm. And people say, oh, coffee mugs, is that a good deal? Give them whatever you want. But I'll hand sign in a permanent marker. I just sent one to Amber at New Hampshire Association of Realtors. Thank you, Amber, and I make sure their name looks cool. And then I sign it. We put it in a box with a note. We send it to them. So anybody who signs up for a training gets that, seminars gets that. And you know, you always wonder, what do they think of those? And I can't tell you how many times People call me up and say, don't tell David, but somebody broke the coffee mug that he sent. Would you please have him do another one? They love it. And I've had people get on the phone with me and they hold it up and they see the signature on it, the first line. So, yeah, I did that right away. That didn't take a lot of education to figure that out. Okay. Just thank the customer in any way you can. More personal, the better. Fair enough. Okay. Um, so... I guess, you know, once again, we're trying to tie things back to the personal branding. So I want to kind of learn more about your progression from like starting in real estate to realizing that speaking was something you wanted to do. And that, that's a great way to produce value and to get in front of people and to get them to know you on kind of a bigger scale. So like th that's, I think, kind of the, um, like one of the biggest achievements you can have when it comes to personal branding, being able to get out and to speak in front of people. So, like, how how did you get to that point? I always had it in me. I look back when I was a kid, I was either the class clown or I, I'd do impersonations and make my parents laugh. So I always had, I had inside of me something that I wanted to express myself, and I didn't know what it was. I couldn't put my finger on it. And it was not until I did that presentation as a guest instructor did I get in touch with it. I finally matched the feeling I wanted and the feeling I was getting. That's it. So after that, uh, I was listening, listening to a video by Arnold Schwarzenegger, who said the minute he figured out he wanted to be a bodybuilder, the minute that's what he wanted to do, be a bodybuilder and a movie star, et cetera, he said everything else was easy because now he knew where he wants to go. So once you know where you want to go on a freeway, it's easy. I'm going to take a left, I'm going to take a right, and if that road's closed, we'll find another way. I know where I'm going to go. So I knew I wanted to do speaking. So for me, it was a career. And I found a way. It was the lowest paying job in real estate, but it was the most fun. And then my next goal was, how can I have fun and make money? And it turned out that I could start charging higher fees. That helped. But the big one was selling products, you know, audio cassettes were big, now it's podcast, video VHS was big, now we've all online, but I got into the video world of delivering value that way, and that's what really put us on the map. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think of the rest of your question, there was something else. Oh, for speaking for your viewers who are going to do public speaking but not as a career, mm -hmm. it is a great way to generate business. People are like, oh, I'm scared of public speaking. Shut up. Just get good at it. Go to a Toastmaster, figure, it video, figure, out, figure out a way to do it. Everybody is a good public speaker on something for which they have passion and knowledge. If you have those two things, you know about something you're passionate about, you're going to be a great speaker. It's like I had friends of mine, they say, well, I don't want to give a eulogy, I'm not a good speaker. And I go, it is not about being a good speaker. It's about delivering the passion and the emotion for somebody you love and sharing that. And people come back and say, thanks for having me give that eulogy. Just give the eulogy, mm -hmm. you know. And they say, well, I'm afraid. It's not about you. It's about the person who died mm -hmm. and honoring. That's getting a little extreme on speaking. Mm -hmm. 
So obviously we're going to have different um, people listening to this coming from different markets and different positions. So how can somebody in, let's say, um, commercial um, real estate take and run with this? How can somebody in business solutions like actually get to the point where they can be speaking about certain topics? Um, how would that work in other sectors? Because obviously real estate itself, like there's a lot to unpack there, but how would somebody else in a different field be able to do the same thing? Start with something about which you're knowledgeable, passionate about, and that you think would interest your customers, whatever that is in your industry. And put together kind of a quick bullet pointed presentation mm -hmm. and get that right. Then, there's so many uh, groups that are looking for speakers. Um, I just spaced out the name. What are some of those? Um, uh, the optimists, and uh, you know, you can go all all those different groups are always looking for speakers. Uh, local bit, rotary groups, things like that, and get in touch with all your local businesses and things like that. Uh, or charitable groups to say, are you looking for a speaker on something, and perhaps do that. Other thing is that if you don't have option to that, th those are good things to video record and put them online. That's mm -hmm. a, a great way to get it start some kind of YouTube channel mm -hmm. and and deliver whatever, five, six, seven minute video presentations on something. Um, what was I watching? You know, I was, well, this Porsche Track Connect app where you can overlay lateral G-forces over the video. I was doing a search for that and I find some guys that really are good at knowing how to do that and I found another guy, here's how to change the wheel and torque it. And, and they were giving value. They weren't promoting their services necessarily, but they were mm -hmm. teaching me how to do something. So I'm more likely to go back and watch that. That's the car world. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, I, I think it did. And I mean, you know, one thing I'd add on to that is, you know, figure out subjects that people are genuinely interested in. So if you get a lot of, um, like, common questions from your customers yeah. or potential opportunities, to take a moment to just dig into that, you know, and and unpack it because there's there's so many things that your customers don't know about what you do about the space that you're in so if you can speak more on it and provide value in that regard people are going to tune in yeah i just saw an email from a realtor this morning who was he said a kind of a pro provocative headline he said not all mortgage interest is deductible and i went yeah, that's right. There is a limit. I actually forgot what the limit was. And I went in and talks about 750000 on first and second homes. However, you refinance and you take money out and use it personal, then that portion isn't. And I went, oh, that's that's good information. Because I haven't focused on the specific real estate laws for a long time. I'm more into training. But that's the kind of thing that I know his viewers will probably appreciate. I, I thought that was a good email. Well, I was reading on my phone. I want to go back and look at it later. Okay, so let's uh, really break this down a little bit so um, I'm one of the viewers of this and you know I don't have a big LinkedIn presence but I'm trying to build my book of business I'm trying to build new relationships what are some quick actionable items to get started well if you have customers then I would start there and get on the phone and call every one of them and um, and have it be kind of a personal call how are you doing what can I do for you and then if it feels right, and again, this is a judgment call everybody's got to make. If it feels right, say to the customer, you know what, I'm also calling because I need your help. And then go on and say, you know, we've got this product or service that works for a lot of different people. Of all the people you know, who would be most likely to be interested in a product like this? So it is a sales call. Mm -hmm. So that's step one. Yeah, and, and see and start generating referrals that way. Mm -hmm. And then, regardless of what happens on that call, I follow up the note. You know, handwritten notes, I th think are powerful. Nobody doesn't open right, them. Right, right. Nobody doesn't open a handwritten note. Yeah. Period, end of story. Yeah, we do it. Yeah, oh, yeah, good for you. And they open and say, you know, thanks for your time on the phone the other day, and start working your current sphere of influence. And after that, it, if I got into industry, I'd try to find out, well, who is best identify my best customer, like who is most likely to use it. Yes. So for our online training, I know who's gonna, they're absolutely not a customer for it, and I can identify who would be. There's certain companies that are doing it in in-house training, we don't even call them, because I know they wouldn't use my service. So after identifying your best customer, identify them, whether they're local, national, however you do that, and then find a way to reach out to them, whether it's a phone call or a handwritten note or something. I would not start with an email. I cannot, for the life of me, I get all these emails, you know, we do SEO, we do this. I go, seriously, you think I'm going to turn over an important business decision, some jerk on an email? 
you know, and you look at it, it's dot R U D T. No. So you want to know what's funny? I mean, we provide SEO. Yep. We get SEO emails from other people trying to do our SEO. <laughs> it's like, and they're like, yeah, your company looks great. It's like if you just read a little bit, you would see the something you already do. <laughs> it's it's wild. So I, I feel your pain. It's unbelievable yeah. how they think that works. And right. I suppose you know it's the shotgun approach. Right. And so once identifying that, I would think back to what would be a great way to, to contact that company and think it through. And I, and I don't have the right answer for everything, but I would, what would be unique, something they'd read? I mean, mail. You know, people open mail, and I'd hand address it so it gets opened rather than a mailing label, mm -hmm. and introduce yourself, and then maybe follow up with a phone call, may I call, and then just keep following up. Over and over and over. You don't want to be obnoxious, but right. find some nice ways to follow up. Um, and I think if I had some kind of package to send, generate business, I'd have a list of clients mm -hmm. with their permission. I'd be careful in that. And I would also have a list of some kind of testimonial mm -hmm. and include that in the package. Mm -hmm. Some people say you can FedEx something like that, kind of a mixed thing. One, it looks like you're wasting money. You, the good news, you get attention. The bad news is that was really kind of a waste of money, especially if you're local. But you could have a courier, you know, you can do a courier here in Twin Cities for, I don't know, 10 bucks or mm -hmm. something. Sure. Um, UPS overnight letters. So find some unique way to, to get in front of them, to cut through, because depending on the business, somebody's going to block the stuff that comes in. So Go that's ahead. definitely more on, like, the lead gen, I need to go out and get business side of things. Yep. But on top of that, as you know, like, if you're putting out that valuable content and you're, you're trying to build value with your audience, what do those steps look like? You know, I'm, I'm just thinking of, you know, a CMO that's listening and, you know, we want to build these relationships and it's been a lot of one-on-one -on -one stuff, but then you have the ancillary stuff too that needs to be worked in the background. The, the posts that you're putting out, just kind of talking about what you're doing, value, how does that translate? Like, where, where would you go with that? Uh, it's a tough question because there's so many different businesses. I can only think in terms of mine, I, I had a base of clients that were my seminar clients. Mm -hmm. And when we, in 2008, when the whole real estate market crashed, they weren't hiring speakers anymore. We went from 100 seminars a year to nine. Try to budget for that. I thought, what can we do to get in front of our viewers? And we knew that they couldn't afford to bring in speakers and pay for the fees in the airfare. We knew online delivery was the way to go, but the bandwidth still wasn't that good. Even in 2008, people talk streaming video. No, it's not streaming, it's buffering video. It, <laughs> yeah. it, has, it didn't stream for another five years. Mm -hmm. We decided to start some kind of service, give value, and I started a video called FFT, Free First Tuesday. And I would shoot a 12-minute video on something. You know, how to get a multiple offer accepted, how to prepare your buyers for buyer, whatever. I, you know, we've got a, hundreds and hundreds of topics. And we put those out and we emailed everybody in our database, just said, you know, Everybody's going through a tough time, don't have a lot of money, so here, you know, here's a video. I hope it helps, and people thanked me for it, it was great. I said, you know what, why the heck did we call it Free First Tuesday? At least let's get some mileage out, and we changed it to KFT, Knox First Tuesday. And we started back in old one, we're, we're just gonna shoot KFT 146 this week, so we've been banging those things out. And then in 2009, we started the online subscription model, and then they had to pay to get all the Knox First Tuesdays and all the other different videos we did. But that's how we got people to know who we were by giving away the free videos. Mm -hmm. And we'll still post short free videos. In fact, we're looking to now take some of our videos and start posting them for free. Uh, like we posted one on agent safety. We thought that would be a good one to give away. How to set up a video conference space. So we're going to start posting those. Mm -hmm. What were your initial thoughts of giving that much value away for free? Not a problem. We'll get anything anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Fair enough. You know, yeah. we weren't making any money anyway. Yeah, so why not give it away? Right. And I heard somebody else say that give away your good stuff, not your bad stuff. Because if you give away the good stuff, they go, my gosh, if they're giving this for free, imagine if we paid. Mm -hmm. So we didn't hold back. Um, when we did do the Knox First Tuesday, we had a public and a member version. The public version did stop halfway through. So if you'd like to see the rest, tune in. And sometimes that worked, sometimes it didn't. But at least they got half of it. And then uh, we had some of on YouTube, 
And it got to the point where people, oh no, we already subscribed to your training. I said, no you don't. Oh yeah, we watch your YouTube stuff all the time. So and we found out that our YouTube was backfiring. They already thought they were getting all of our videos. So we actually, I said, yank them off of YouTube. I'm not going to give them away anymore. At some point, giving away just didn't work. Mm -hmm. So we're very careful now. If you could touch on um, kind of your, your MO when it comes to the public speaking and how that affects your brand, mm -hmm. um, and also the content you're putting out, how does that affect the brand? Because you're a partner in the business. You could be silent. You could just be kind of behind the scenes. but. Being out in front is obviously really benefiting the business. Could you touch on that a little sure. bit? Sure. Well, I, my business started off in seminars, doing 3,500 live seminars. So my business really was a practice, not a business, because it was just me. As we started to grow what I've called the Netflix of Real Estate Training, that now became a business, because now we had a huge content platform. We said millions building. We got 600 videos on that. So the live seminars, which of course I hope we get back to doing those, get me in front of people and there'll be broker owner managers in the audience and I'll get their business cards and I have a chance to follow up with them. So the speaking is great for supporting the training. The other thing is posting some portions of our videos for free on YouTube or wherever we, we want to do that is another way of getting in front of people where they watch the video and then they'll go to check out a free trial. So we'll send them to davidknox.com and they can go sign up for a free trial and then when they do a free trial, I call them. So we, we don't ask for their phone number it's optional because the more you ask for, the less you get, as you know. So I'll just ask for a first name, last name, email, and I do have a text field say, you know, what's your training challenge? And and if you take a list of all the things that they say is their training challenge, it becomes our marketing. Because if they say, you know, we need meet a sales meeting, we're hiring new agents, we're trying to recruit, we've got to build a training program, well, if that's what they put in as their need, well, then that's what we're going to advertise. So that little challenge has become our key words in our advertising. So that's kind of cool. And then I call them up, and they once <laughs> I can't believe is this is this really you, David? This is me, and you may speak to me at the tone. Be you know we joke around with them, and they I can't believe you're really calling me. And I go, and then I say to them, I said that's how bad customer service is in America that I can impress you with a phone call. So the seminar support the the training and vice versa, so it all kind of works together. And I, so back to my seminars. For good or bad, I become the face of the company, but I also am trying to step back and get me out of the videos and feature all of our support instructors because I don't, I don't want people sick of me and they're going right. to, I don't want that. So I'll be the spokesperson and then I turn it over. A lot of the interviews I do are blind interviews where they never see my face. They don't even hear my question. They just answer the question in context. So from starting the um, Netflix of real estate, like how long has it taken to get all those videos um, and to get you to where you're now quite frequently speaking on the company from that perspective? Because the way I see it, we're going to have people listening that, you know, they're behind the scenes and they're not putting themselves out there. And there's a lot of like resistance or maybe even some self-doubt as to getting started. So maybe to kind of put that in picture could help a little bit. Well, I started the online training, I believe, in 2009. We had 67 videos, mm -hmm. and ba basically those were parts of our uh, DVDs, and we cut them up. We started with those, and now we're at 608. In fact, now we're going in and weeding out the old ones. And the, the seminars, that really was, the, was my main business, seminars plus selling videos and DVDs. Well, when the seminar, the uh, DVD market dried up, that's the other reason that drove us to online. Cause, no, it's too bad, no DVDs. Like, like, people look at this, what's this? Mm -hmm. So everything had to go online. And uh, and then COVID took seminars out. So now I'm back, well, I can't do seminars. But uh, the other thing I do, this, is, this would be, I guess, obvious, is I did about two or 300 Zooms during COVID, and now I'm still doing it. And before that, I offer that as a customer service, you know, in addition to watching me, our videos, I'll come in and do a live sales meeting for you. And then I, sh I take the agents to the website, how many of you guys have logged in? Oh, hey, oh, you haven't, oh, come on, they're paying for it. You gotta log in, let me show you this, let me show you that. So I do Zooms as a way of having that, you know, I talked about the personal face-to-face, phone-to-phone, and now Zoom to Zoom. I love doing them. Um, I've got a video called How to Set Up a Zoom Video Conference where we talk about having a good microphone, a good mic, 100 bucks, you get a good mic, 100 bucks, you can get a good LED light and raise it so your eye level. So I teach them fundamentals of how to look good on Zoom. And by the way, all the jokes, Saturday Night Live, everybody talking about Zoom, you look at people on Zoom and they look horrible because they don't understand, you know, three basic things, audio, lighting, and, and camera angle. Mm -hmm. For no money, I can make people look, yeah, you're looking up their nose to the ceiling, they don't get it. And by the end, out of respect for them, they've yeah, never done yeah, Zoom, they don't know. Sure. But so 
I teach people how to look good on Zoom because I believe that will be a point of difference. And we go one step further for our bigger Zooms. We've got a, our own TV studio and some high definite 4K cameras. And we Zoom from our studio instead of in front of a laptop. We'll do it from the studio. So we've got full lighting, everything. We've got a, a smart board where I can write and interact. And it, I'll tell you what, when people see five Zooms before me, some guy looking up his nose and they see us in the studio, we blow them away. Right. Sure. That's fun. Not every not everybody can have a studio, but they can look good on Zoom. Mm -hmm. So I'm listening to this and I'm thinking, okay, this is something I want to do. I want to try it. But who's going to listen to this? How do I get the word out? And the first thing I think of is invite your customers, invite invite your clients right now, and and start to build that um, build the excitement around it. And then you can start to invite people you don't know and then you can start to build value with them. I'm sure it just grows over time. Could yeah, so that goes back to come up with a topic that's really good mm -hmm. and do part of it, record part of it and put it on uh, Facebook or LinkedIn or wherever you want to post it. Then send the link to everybody in your database. I assume everybody has got email and then I would get on the phone and call them and say, by the way, you know, we've got this, you can take a look at a two minute version of what we're talking about. I'd be happy to do this for you live. Mm -hmm. When would be a good time to do that? Do you have your calendar in front of you? You've got to close and say, hey, do you have your calendar in front of you? What's a good day? Well, we could do, how often do you have a meeting? How about next Tuesday at 5 o'clock? And, and obviously, you've got to have the pro version of Zoom and start setting up those Zoom meetings. And then in those meetings, deliver value. And people say, wow, that's really cool. And then maybe they'll move to whatever the next stage in exactly. is the product you got. Yeah. And give that, give those away for free. It's great two-way interaction. Mm -hmm. One quick little LinkedIn tip for everybody. Um, posting as a company is good, but posting as your person is better because LinkedIn will not show like company videos on your feed. If you go to check out the company, they're there, but I don't think I've ever seen just a company video unless it's paid, just floating around on the feed. Okay. So post it as your person. Yeah, that's good. Sure. One of the tips. Yep. Cool. Good point. And then obviously you could just do your own, you have your own YouTube channel, right. Vimeo channel and then take the unique link, discrete, discrete link to whatever video and send that out so people can mm -hmm. just, when they click on it, they're not going through this maze of Facebook, LinkedIn, and bam, they go right to the video. Mm -hmm. sure. And of course you could set that up on your home video and your webpage. That's another thing, is having a lot of these videos on your on your webpage, you know, a gallery of short videos. Mm -hmm. And I've seen a lot of people do that and then you get to the video and the video is horrible and they've got poor lighting and poor audio because then it backfires. Mm -hmm. So don't put it up unless it's good content, well lit and good sound and you're in the video business so you know what it isn't about the video, it's about the audio. That's right. why you've got these expensive microphones and screens. Forget the video, it's the yeah. audio that we've got to be good at. Okay, so obviously we've unpacked a lot when it comes to personal branding but let's get back to the basics and kind of just walk us through what those steps look like in summary. First step is that we're the literally where the rubber meets the road, where that very, very, very first contact, two people actually do connect. And we start with all of our branding and advertising and marketing and all that kind of stuff. And then finally somebody calls, text, emails, whatever. They finally it, it works. You get somebody, and that's where I think businesses fail. As I talked about, and I'll rant this forever and ever if they don't answer the phone. If somebody telephones, it's axiomatic that they want to talk on the phone. If they text, they want to text. If they email, they want to email. So, and respond in kind, obviously, but I don't think any good relationship happens until you finally get a verbal verbal conversation. So play the little games of text and email, whatever. But when I look at realtors, they have uh, photos on their card that are 10, 12 years old. And go, come on, somebody's gonna see you and they think, my gosh, what happened to you? Did anybody else get hurt? You know, I said, just the, the photo, get a new photo every year or two when your life changes. Uh, email signatures, simple things like that. Either A, they don't have an email signature, so I know they're idiots. We're talking about these spam emails that just says, Bob, I don't know, city, state, zip, nothing. Uh, the next step up, they might put a city, but they don't put addresses. Also, when I see websites without addresses, I don't trust them. If there's not a physical address, I go, why are you hiding? I want a physical address or I'm not going to do business with you. Email signatures need to be in text so they're clickable on a mobile device. And I get these email signatures that some branding expert said, oh, look at this great graphic. Well, you can't click on the bloody thing. It's worse. So I got to look at the phone number. I got to write it down on a legal pad, write down the next number. Then I have to open up, then it goes, it's like, come on. And so, by the way, some of these branding marketing people, they're in love with stupid graphics and four point type. You know, you have to get a magnifying glass to read it. So yeah. I think uh, function over form, start with the function and then. So email signatures, respond to emails, recent photos, uh, easy to read bombs, things like that. And when somebody finally contacts your business, make them glad they did it. Simple enough. Yeah. Yeah. 
So you get them there, you get them to see you, and then you take care of them once they're there. Yeah. That's pretty simple. And, and by the way, there's one other way to, <laughs> to improve your brand, and that's uh, when you make a mistake. Because uh, you're going to make them, something's going to go wrong. I remember some of our early packaging, we'd sell a DVD and they open it up and had all that powdered stuff in it that came out. I don't know if you remember those now, they're all bubble wrap. But this powder came over and he wrote a really scathing email to me. He said, you know, I opened your packaging and I had all this stuff all over the place. So I'm now taking a vacuum cleaner to clean it off my desk and my pants and everywhere else. I said, oh my gosh. I said, let's go look at our packaging. I went, oh my, look at this. If the guy doesn't open it right, all this asbestos stuff comes out. So we got rid of all that and got new packaging. But you know, I'd call the guy up and say, "I am just horribly sorry. Sorry, we're going to send you three more DVDs in bubble wrap packaging." And that was another thing I learned about making a mistake. If all you do is fix the mistake, you're now even. So if a product doesn't work and all you do is replace the product, they're re you're really not even because now they had to wait, they had to ship, they had to call. So when we fixed a problem, I said, "How can we make it better?" And maybe send them two products or three products or something. We tried to set it up so if we made a mistake, the outcome of the mistake is they came out better, not just even. Right. And that, just people love that. Mm -hmm. When people call, I've got this DVD, and the thing that I put into my DVD, and they're all, you know, they're ready for a fight because they know you're going to say, I'm sorry, but you bought the DVD in our 30 days. I said, ma'am, I'm sorry, we're going to send you a new one. We'll send you a new one. We're going to fix it, okay? Just let me say, whatever, we're going to fix it. I promise you that. So tell me again what's going on. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's, they didn't set the region code for the DVD, and I go, Send them another DVD. You know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, by the way, go region code number one for North America. <laughs> so, uh, responding to mistakes is important. And I think about remember United Airlines. They were trying to kick some guy off a flight, some kind of overbooking, and it turned out to be a ten thousand dollar lawsuit, and uh, they lost tons of business. Their stock dropped. And, and I thought, you know, you could have given the guy ten grand to get off the flight, ten thousand, and you'd have been five million dollars yeah. better off. Just and I see sometimes uh, and the, gay and agents. The, well, and beyond that, just the bad press. Yeah. So how, how many customers did they lose? You know, you don't, you'll never really know. Yeah. But, yeah. So some of those problems, they get real self-righteous about. Well, it's not our company policy. Well, there's sometimes when maybe use some judgment, maybe just let go. Not all the time. I mean, with some fairness. But but I'll see sometimes gate agents. Well, sir, you're gonna have to check that second piece. And I'm thinking, you know, the flight's empty. They're only booking half the seats. He's got an open role. Right. Just let him take it. Just let him take it on. <laughs> yeah, well, on that note, I think we're going to wrap up. Um, but before we do, Mr. Knox, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. 30 second plug. What do you got going on in your life? Well, I, the only viewers that I can help that are watching this would be those in the real estate industry, broker, owner, managers who want to train their agents. And that's what we did starting in 2009. We put, uh, we're up to 600 videos online. Uh, I've used the analogy, we're kind of like the Netflix of real estate training, where people can tune in and have all their agents watch videos on listing, selling, negotiating, pricing, buyers, sell, you name it, and build uh, curriculum and action plans and use it to train their agents. And we feature top agents from all over the United States, and we go on location, videotape real transactions. So it's not a talking head over PowerPoint. It's many of them are on location. Very cool. So if they're broker owners, uh, go to davidknox.com and check it out. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be here. All right, perfect. Until next time. All right. <laughs> thanks for watching. Thank you. <laughs>